the game. Don't look at what I wear. <laughs> oh man, I am excited to be here. I know you're excited to be here, and, and if you're, if you heard me say a minute ago, if you're visiting with us today, uh, I want to encourage you, really encourage you, to come back and hear our our senior minister, our lead minister, Chris Hutz. Uh, Chris is an excellent, excellent minister here and delivers a wonderful message to us every week. Uh, he and Jessica are away on a deserved vacation, and so I don't want you to, uh, you know, hear me today and say, I'll never get out of that place. So I want you to make sure you come back and uh, hear Chris because he's, he's doing a fantastic job. He's been here with us for over 12 years now, and Jessica is the children's ministry leader for us. And just an absolutely grand, fantastic uh, ministry team. We're so excited to have them here. So I want you to come back and hear them. You know, I, I suppose that in a crowd this size, I feel like that somebody's probably going to respond positively to this. How many in here kind of enjoy being a prankster? You like playing jokes on people? Yeah, John, read that. Did, that, that. Go ahead and tell the truth, let the Lord love you. I mean, how many of you really kind of like to do something like that? Yeah, I see the hands are literally come up. You know, we all kind of like to, to play that. Joke, you know, there, there's a, a time of year that we all kind of find a little special if you like to do that. You know, that's called uh, April Fool's Day. <laughs> How many of you just, man, can't wait to wake up on April Fool's Day and you say, man, who am I going to prank this morning, you know? I used to live for it. I used to love it. I really did. And uh, one day my wife finally told me, she said, honey, you do that one more time, man, I'm going to hit you upside the head. <laughs> now, now, we didn't cover that in our marriage talk a few weeks ago. I'll just let you know that that didn't come up. But, but I learned, learned after a while that usually if you do too much pranking around, it always comes back to bite you. you know? <laughs> it always finds a way back home to you, and it's not always a good thing to do. And I remember that that was this couple, Bill and Nancy, and they'd been dating for a while. And they were getting ready to get married, and it was like a few days before their, their wedding, and they had promised themselves, committed to themselves before they got married, said, we're always going to be honest, and always tell each other the truth in whatever we do. And so about two days before the wedding, you know, Bill got a little bit antsy, and he said, well, you know, I haven't told Nancy about my stinking feet. He said, you know, my feet, the odor is so bad, it'll burn through carpet. And he said, I, I, so he went to his dad and said, what am I supposed to do about this? And he said, look, I got it all figured out for you. Don't worry about it. Go down. Walmart's got these new micro-type socks, and you can put them over your, slip one of your feet, kill all the odor. No problem. Just put them on before you go to bed at night. Trouble's over. He said, okay, did that work? Well, he didn't know that Nancy was home talking to her mother. He said, you know, Bill doesn't know that I have the worst morning breath that you can possibly imagine. Her breath would peel paint. And, and so she said, what am I supposed to do? I don't want to wake up on, my, on our honeymoon. And I gross it out right to start with. He said, look, don't worry about it. Here's a mouthwash that you can use. It's, the, it's guaranteed to kill all your germs. Just put it over in the bathroom right there and make sure you get up first. And run to the bathroom, wash your mouth out, kill all those germs, and everything will be fine. Okay. So they didn't tell each other the problems. And they went off and they got married. And honeymoon went fine. And about three months into the marriage... Right in the middle of the night, this big limb fell right outside their bedroom window. Boom! Startled Bill, he jumped up before he even realized what he was doing. He jumped up and he got to the door, to the door of his bedroom, and he realized he, one of the socks was gone. <laughs> he said, oh no. Before he could even realize it, Nancy had jumped out of bed and she had landed about this close to his face. And she said, Bill, is everything all right? And he said, oh. <laughs> Call 911. I think you swallowed my sock. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't pay to prank people. You know what I mean? Sometimes we do it with a good intention, sometimes we are, but if you really want us to boil it all down to it, you know, pulling pranks and deceiving people, it's just a lie. It's just a lie. Has anybody, I'm just going to take a wild guess here, has anybody ever received a telemarketing call. Yeah. <laughs> I was so shocked. You know, my favorite though, and, and I, I think about a month after we had bought our car, uh, about a year and a half ago, I got in the mail this piece of paper and it says, attention required, now! Your warranty has expired. And I said, I just bought the car. How can that be possible? You know, there's a whole world out here that the only thing they like to do is try and do everything they can to deceive 
You know, I, I'm not sure. I, I've got to ask Lynn, but I'm sure Boca County Sheriff's Office, probably, probably every law enforcement that I know of has either an officer or a division that's set up for fraud. I know our state does, and I know the FBI does, and I know the international agencies, because there is so much fraud and deception in our world today by people that want to steal whatever precious possessions you have. Just influenced by that evil of wanting to desire, that's all they live for, is how can I get somebody's stuff from them? And you know, that's bad enough, but I have to tell you this morning, I, I mean, I would really love to come up here today because I love to be light and tell stories and do some things as well, but I, you know, what God has put on my heart this morning, this morning to talk to you about is really serious stuff. It really is. And it's something that I would tell you uh, two weeks ago, Chris and I were talking, and uh, his aunt or whoever it was just confirmed they had their vacation spot, and he said, you going to preach? <laughs> and I said, Chris, two weeks notice. That's not a lot of notice. And I said, but you know what? I got a message that's on my heart. And I went home that night, and I, I sat down to think about that message, and I, I realized almost immediately what I had talked to Chris about. That's not what God would to preach about this morning. And I immediately began to uh, pray about it, and God has placed this message on my heart, and it's one that's, uh, that we need to hear, one that I need to hear. Because you see, there's a force in this world today that's always been here, and that force is evil. And that force is backed by the power of Satan in all of his mind. And all the things we're going to examine, all kinds of scriptures this morning. I'm, I'm more of a teacher preacher. I, I, I love passages of scriptures, and I don't want to be giving you a lot of opinions. I want to, I want to show you God's word. That I have a real passion for God's word, and I want to, I want to show you the scriptures of the things about this evil force. Because you see, there's one called Satan, and of all the powers that he has, his greatest weapon that he uses is deception. He is the master deceiver. And he will use every power that he has, everything he can do, his one focus and his one purpose at all for his existence is to defraud you and I out of the greatest gift God could give us. That his son died on the cross to give us that free gift of grace, the gift of salvation. <coughs> Satan hates God. With every fiber of his being, he hates God. And what Satan has come to the conclusion based on my reading of the scriptures and what I see happening in the world today is that he hates you and I. Any believer, Satan wants to destroy. And there's not a question, as we go through our passage today, there is not a single question that you will leave here today not understanding that Satan, his power of deception is real and he is going to work overtime between now and to the time that Jesus comes back to try to deceive God's people. There is no question that there are going to be people deceived. And I hate to tell you, probably in a room this size, some of us may end up being deceived if we're not careful. It's not a question whether deception is coming. The only question that you and I have to answer this morning is will I be deceived? Now you know if you've been here before when I've filled in for Chris, you know I love to do this. Some people think it's corny, but today is more relevant than ever. If you've got your Bible with you or your smartphone with your Bible on, I want you, if you will, to hold it up and humor me this morning. And I want you to repeat after me. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. God's, holy God's holy word. And I believe, and I believe that it will change my life and those I share it with.
Father, we're at this moment of time when you have written certain words in my heart. And God, my heart's desire is that no one will go out the back door today the same as they were when they came in the front door. They came in this morning. God, we invite you. We ask you to have your word change our life. Prick our heart. Draw us closer to you. And everything that's said and done today, Lord, may it be your will and your words. May all the glory be given to you. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to start our discussion in the Word of God itself, and I want us to read a couple of passages. First from Ephesians, the 6th chapter, and the 12th verse, as a reminder to us. Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, and he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In Revelation 12, 17, we hear this word coming as it's revealed to John, the Apostle John. So the dragon was enraged with the woman, the woman being the church, and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. For these two passages of scriptures, I want to be very clear to you that we are at war. This is not my opinion. This is what the Word of God has just said that I've just read to you. God's Word says we're in a struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers, against the forces of evil. You know, Satan, our enemy, is described in various ways. And I want us to use two scriptures that we can see to give us a real taste of who Satan is this morning. For John, the 8th chapter, verse 44, this is Jesus, what he says about Satan. He says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church to give them warning. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants are masquerades as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. I want us to understand that in God's word he gives us clear description of who Satan is. Satan is a created being. God created him. He rebelled against God in heaven. He was cast down. We're told in Revelation 12, chapter, beginning of that chapter. But Satan's main power that he has is this power of lies, this power of deceptions. We can see in our culture today, if we just open our eyes, the deceptions and the lies that Satan has used to attack the truth. He has come against our culture and our country and across this world. And he is the master of deception, the master of deceit. And I want to tell you, the first thing in all of his smarts and all of his deceptions that Satan has managed to do across this world today is convince people that he's not real. I want you to think about that. What Satan has done and what he's been very successful in is that he has succeeded in convincing so many people across this world today that he doesn't exist. And I can prove this through a Barna survey that was done in 2009. Barna is the, is the uh, survey group Chris talked about a month or so ago that does surveys amongst Christian people. This was not a survey that was done through the whole world in general. This was just sent out to 1,875, a sample of Christians throughout the United States, and they were asked to agree or disagree with this statement. The statement was given was this. Satan is not a real living being but just a symbol of evil. Did you get all that? Satan is not a real being, but just a symbol of evil. 40% of the Christians surveyed strongly agreed with that statement. Another 19% somewhat agreed with that statement. 8% said they didn't want to believe. So when you add all of that up, with 67% of Christians that were surveyed did not even believe that Satan is real. How in the world did this happen? How could this possibly have happened? I want to give this 
evidence is the first evidence of the truth of what I'm preaching to you this morning is the first evidence that God and Satan at war, that Satan and his power of deception has been winning battle after battle after battle after battle and is deceiving and deceiving even God's people. His deception is already in place. Yes, it's going to get worse before the end time, but I want us to see that his deception is done. And, and, and you ask yourself, how does a person that claim to be a Christian, now I don't know what they really stood for, but they answered the survey and said they were a Christian, but how can a person that says they are a Christian read this? What you held up, what we confess to be God's holy word, God's truth. And from Genesis to Revelation, it talks about Satan. We talk about a lot in the church about unbelief. We talk about people that haven't come to Christ and, and people that don't believe in Jesus. You know what I'm telling you this morning? There is a real concern of mine. There are people that don't even believe there's evil. Amen. Listen, people. Think about the logic behind this. If Satan can convince people that there is no Satan, there's no hell, there's no really forces of evil or, or no consequences, why do you need a Savior? <laughs> why do you need Jesus? You don't think that Satan's clever enough to understand that and recognize that? So if he can convince you and I and people in the church that Satan is not really real, what's the big deal? I'll serve when I want to serve. I'll come to church when I want to come to church. I'll believe in God to the extent that I want to. It's all on the table. They really don't mind. That's not what God's Word says. Are you telling me that that cultural influence has not crept into the church? I think it has. And here's the thing that's so alarming to me about this. We look at prophecies in the, in the Old Testament. I mentioned this in Sunday school this morning. I've been teaching a series on the end times in our class since April. And I encourage you, if you're not coming to Sunday school, come. Oh. We're doing details on some of this stuff. But I want to tell you this that in the Old Testament, we see through the prophet Micah, through the prophet Hosea, <laughs> Isaiah, Jeremiah, and one more, I forgot. They prophesied about Christ's birth 700 to 600 years before Jesus was born. Every prophecy that was done in the Old Testament that we read today came to fruition exactly as the prophet said. That helped us build our faith. Amen? Amen. Well, let me tell you something in God's Word. We never refer to them much as prophecy, but they are. I want you to look at what the Scriptures tell us there. Because... In this battle that we're in, there's only one thing Satan wants to accomplish. And I want you to think about it in your life right now today. I want you to think about it in people that you know have fallen away from their faith. I want you to think about how this spiritual war takes place. It's not like there's a whole band of demons over here coming at you and you see them and you know you're going to fight them and we're going to do all... You know, he works with you know, windows, whispers, <coughs> doubt. Because see, the way Satan works, he wants to attack our faith. And he does that by introducing doubt. And he wants to take the doubt that comes in that he gets into our heart and turn it into unbelief. He wants to challenge our belief that God is all-powerful. He wants to challenge us when things go awry in our life. It's why you hear people say, well, if there was a God, why did this happen? He works overtime to introduce thoughts in our heart and our mind that God is not sovereign and that He can be replaced. He might be replaced with recreation. He may be replaced with jobs. He may be replaced with all kinds of things, with, with unfortunately, with drug abuse and all kinds of things that's crept into our culture. Things start replacing who God is. Now, this is what the Word of God says about the subject of being deceived. And I want us to start with Jesus' words Himself. In Matthew 24, chapter, verses 10 and 11, this is what the Word says. Jesus said this, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And he's talking about believers now. Jesus says, Many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Verse 24 and 25. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 
See, I've told you in advance. You realize how many times in the scriptures, in the gospels, Jesus says to us, be on alert. Wake up. Paul writes to the Thessalonica church and he says, we are not children of darkness, we are children of light. We don't need these things to sneak up on us, but we are having a lot of the church because of our apathy, because of our love of self and our love of the world. We have allowed God's, His power to be diminished, and we have allowed this culture of deceit to creep in and lessen the importance of God and His church. Jesus warned us of this. And Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, the fourth chapter, first verse, first verse. Paul emphasizes this. It's the only place in the scripture that I know this is ever used. He says the Spirit clearly, and I think he said explicitly, says that in latter time some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. The clear Spirit, the Holy Spirit, clearly says that in latter time some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Second Thessalonians, second chapter, the first three verses, when he's talking about Jesus' return. He says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together again, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, to be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as it was from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord will come. No one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawless is revealed the son of destruction. But I want you to pay attention to that last part. For Jesus will not come, he says, until the apostasy comes first. The apostasy is the falling away of the church. We have three clear scriptures that are prophecies. The word of God says clearly that before the end time, before Jesus comes back, that many will fall away from the faith. It's not up for discussion. Well, the people are going to fall away. The only thing that we have to continue to answer ourselves this morning is, will I fall away? Because some are going to fall away. The Word of God says it. And He says it to us as a warning. So that it won't happen to us. It won't happen to us. And, and so we're told in Scriptures about these things that are going to take place. And, and we, it's like we don't even under, sometimes understand what's happening all around us in our culture today. How in our society and United States throughout the world how deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons have already crossed into our culture. Do you think it was an accident that it, back in the 20th century that evolution was introduced? You want to talk about a doctrine of demons? I don't care whether you agree with me or not. What does God's Word say? God created the heavens and the earth. It didn't evolve. It was created. Amen. Amen. God said He created male and female. There's no confusion about God what sex you are. <laughs> the confusion is brought in by Satan. It is a doctrine of demon. And I'm so sorry for those that are troubled and, and are going through all this and, and there are adult people telling them lies. Because God knows what He's doing. And these things have come through. We have totally changed the definition of sexual morality. Man, in all of His wisdom, has decided what sexual moral and what is not immoral. God's Word has been completely replaced. There's no sin in sleeping with your boyfriend and your girlfriend. There's no, sleep, there's no sin in sleeping with one man with another or a woman with a woman. We have decided that. This world. That is a doctrine of demons. There's no way to sugarcoat this, folks. I wish I could. It is the Word of God. It is the truth of God's Word. And I will stand before God and be held accountable as an elder of this church that I'm going to present the truth if you like me or not like me. It's God's truth. And I love you too much not to tell you the truth. And it's the truth. We're going to be accountable. Now, some people will say, maybe it was asked the Sunday school this morning, will I fall away? How do I know? I can tell you, again, God's Word tells us exactly who's going to fall away. I will guarantee you today, you will have the knowledge you walk out this door, whether you will fall away or not. 
because it's clear in the Word of God. Let's read the scriptures this morning. Let us start with 2 Timothy 4th chapter and read verse 3 and 4. Now again, Paul talks about these end times. For the people, for the time will come when people will not put up the sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their ancient ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. 2 Thessalonians 2nd chapter 8 through 10. And then the lawless one will be revealed and the Lord Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of powers through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways the wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Listen to the last sentence. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Paul writing to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and created, worshiped and served cre created things rather than the Creator, Amen. who has forever prayed. Amen. In case you missed the, the synopsis of all three scriptures, in Timothy 4 chapter, they will turn their ears away from the truth. 2 Thessalonians, 2 chapter 10 verse, they perish because they refuse to love the truth. Romans 1, 25. They serve created things rather than the Creator. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. People that will be deceived and fall away, and I pray it will be none of us, but the Word of God says the people that's going to fall away are those that don't love the truth. It's black and white, folks. There is no question, there's no... No, no discussion about it, what the Word says, that in all these three verses of passage Scripture, it is those that do not love the truth. The greatest deception in our culture today is that Satan has placed with leaders throughout this land that, and people in power that what they want and desire is to abolish any absolute truth. Man wants to create our own truth. And when we begin to say that we know what better, better is, then we have replaced God with our own idol. We have replaced absolute truth with man's truth. And man's truth is flawed and filled with fleshiness and sinfulness. And every time we replace God's truth with our truth, we're going down. And you see, that's what we see being permeated in our society and our culture. And it has crept into the church. People don't want to hear the truth. People are offended by the truth. People want to run from the truth. And I'm telling you, the truth is what will save you. Amen. Think about what Jesus said in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus is truth. Amen. He is the truth. The only truth. There is not another truth. Jesus and Jesus only is truth. Amen. And His word is truth. When Jesus talked to the apostles and to us, as John records to us, He was telling them as it was getting closer to the end time, He said, look, it's better for me to go away. Because when I go... I'm going to send you my spirit. And in John 16, 13, he says, my spirit, the spirit of truth. God has given his people his truth. We have the truth of Jesus. We have the truth of God's Holy Spirit who resides in those of us that have been baptized into Christ, who have received God's gift of 
forgiveness and receive the Spirit and receive the promise of eternal life. And God's Holy Spirit, when you read the role and the, the things that the Spirit does, He teaches us. He reveals truth to us. He convicts us when we get off the path and we sin. And you see, what Satan wants to do is he wants us to quench the Spirit. He'll do everything for you to disobey and continue to try to stuff out the Holy Spirit. Because He's the one that will lead us in truth. There's one way I can tell you for sure, without any question, that we won't be deceived. At one point, the people came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, Jesus, tell us. What is the, the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered this in Matthew 22, 36 through 38. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. I'm really and talking about Holy Spirit moments. One of the things that God's Spirit does for us is reveals truth to us. And I think it's imperative every one of us as we walk with Christ. Every day, we need to find that closet, that quiet place. We don't need to carry our cell phones in, no iPods, no telephones of any kind. Just you and the Lord. And ask God through His Holy Spirit to reveal to us, do I really love you with all my heart, my mind, and my soul? And if not, what idol have I put in front of me, God? Our God doesn't want any of us to be lost. He's given us everything. We are told in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that when temptation comes our way, no matter what form it takes, I want you to realize that every sin that comes to us, every temptation that comes to us is a deceit from Satan to, to you to lay down your beliefs and follow your flesh. Don't follow God. Follow me. Follow my desires. Follow yourself. And God says in His Word that God will give you an escape every temptation that he would send your way to the sea. He tells us in James, the fourth chapter, somewhere around verse four, he said, you know what? Just resist Satan. Just resist him. And he'll flee. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 John, the fourth chapter, greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. Satan's above him. He's a defeated enemy. He can't have you. He can't have me unless I choose to follow after the things of the world, the things of my flesh. And say, he'll do everything. I don't, I don't care what someone is going through now. There is nothing that God can't do. And no matter what turmoil may be in your life right now, Satan wants you to believe that this is the end of ends, that there's nothing that can, can change it, that we're hidden down this course, and whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. God can heal all things. He can restore what Satan would destroy. And I want to caution us, so sometimes things don't always work out the way we think. I believe with all my heart that as we have sit here and prayed for Brother Brian, I don't know what the final answer will be, but I'm going to believe until the last breath that God's going to heal him. Yeah. But you know what? If God chooses to take him on down, and I don't, I'm not trying to upset you now. So. But I can tell you this, and I believe these two right here believe this. Whatever God chooses, we're going to say praise God. Amen. Because that place where our brother may go is better than anything here. And I don't care what you may be struggling with. You may be having a time with your child. 
You may be having time with your co-worker. You may be struggling in your marriage. You may be struggling in other relationships. You may feel like that I've come here to this end and rope and I want to warn you now. I want to tell you now because Satan's going to come. He's going to whisper things in your ear. That's going to lead to pain and destruction. I want you to remember and grab a hold of the Word of God and trust God with all of your heart and know that He loves you and that He cares about you. He doesn't want you to see. And all He tells us is His Word. Love Him with all your heart. Love Him with all your heart. Don't give Him half of yourself. Don't give Him a fourth of yourself. I, I want to I encourage you. You know, we have, a, we have a tremendous youth ministry here. We got a lot of people coming and bringing your kids. And that's wonderful. And we're here. We, we have the most wonderful volunteer staff here that are teaching kids and doing the wonderful thing that love the Lord. But I want to remind us all as adults, we need to get into the Word. We need to be fed. And I'm telling you here at After Chapel, we have an adult ministry as well. And we will feed you. We will worship with you. We will pray with you. We will do whatever we have to do to keep the enemy at bay. Because we believe that through the blood of Jesus, He can have a thing to do with you. He will give you a new heart. We all mess up, folks. We've all sinned in here. At some point or another, at some time in our life, we've all failed. I am a sinner of sinners. I stand here before you tonight, today, and I will tell you without any questions, I have sinned against God. I am ashamed that I have sinned. And we'll probably sin again. But I can also tell you, I'm a forgiven child of God. And He will forgive you and give you that second chance and you'll be dead as well. Folks, it's not a question of the deception. I, I, there's a whole other sermon that deals with the end times and all the false miracles that the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to call fire down from heaven. He's going to do things that this world has probably never seen before. Jesus himself says in that passage that if he could, even the elect would be deceived. If you don't love God, if you don't love the truth, if you don't hang on the truth, I don't care what the world's going to do, I don't care what you're going to have to walk through, don't compromise the truth because when we begin to walk away from the truth, we're setting ourselves up to fall into the deceptions of Satan and to the traps of this world, which will can and possibly will lead you to fall away from your faith. You don't have to go there, folks. Just love God with all your heart. Love Him. Recognize that you are a vital part of the ministry of God's kingdom. Every Christian person has been given at least one spiritual gift, the Word says. You are gifted children of God. Together, we come together as the church, connected in ministry, connected with our gifts, to encourage and edify the body of Christ. We are a tremendous force of God in this world. Don't let anybody put this fire out. Let us use it all. Come together. Become part of this body here. Let us join together in this fight to teach each other not to be deceived. To hold on to our faith until we take our last breath. And then, praise God, we'll go on and be with Jesus. What a glorious day that's going to be when we get there. First, it all starts. But if you know Jesus at all, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's, it's, as bad as I hate to say, there's no hope for you. There is no hope without Jesus. There is no hope. You're already deceived if you think there is. If you're living in the world today in sin and you haven't repented of it and you've slipped away, this is the perfect time to rededicate your life this morning. Commit yourself. Say, I'm tired of playing church. As we get closer to the end time, folks, we've got to quit playing church. We've got to be rededicated men and women to serve our Lord and loving Him and putting Him first in all things. Come be a part of that work here at Athens. We would love to have you. But the call of the invitation right now is if you're outside of Christ, as Monica comes up to play, if you haven't accepted Jesus, we've got a baptist ready up here. We don't have to have Chris. All of us get baptized somewhere. We'll get you in. We'll get you done. So if you need to make a decision this morning, we ask that you come forward as we sing the song of invitation.